Hello? Hey, how's it going? Hey, it's going all right. Not too bad at all. I started my day with a little four hours of overtime. Just skated in, skated out. Uh, ran my daughter to do some errands and worked on editing another episode of the podcast. It's been a pretty decent day. How about you? Nice. Well, but hold on a minute. You ran your daughter to do some errands or your daughter ran you to do some errands? Uh, good correction. Yes, she is learning to drive. She is 16 and she's very, very close to getting her parents sign off to drive and get her license. But we're still working on a few things. And so, yeah, she did the driving and I did the stressing. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah. What are you up to? Well, uh, this is the first time in months that I feel like I can say it was not excessively hot here today. Oh. It rained early this morning. And so this afternoon, it was beautiful out. I actually went for a quick little walk about halfway through the afternoon and enjoyed the fact that I could be out without being disgusted by everything. <laughs> vastly different from yesterday when I got in my car at the end of the day and my car temperature said 110 degrees outside. That's gross. Yes. It's just that's there. Nothing good happens at that point. Uh, no, especially in so. Missouri, where it's also 320% humidity. Oh, yes. It's awful. It's killing my running. Uh, just mm. killing it. But hey, I, I was calling today. We talked last week about the soul. And if it's all right with you, I'm just so curious about how some of the things we talked about last week regarding the soul work in practical detail or in practical reality at your job in particular, not at work in general, but in your particular job. So mm. today I'm hoping we can talk about the soul and 911. What do you think? Yeah, I would love to talk about the industry just in general and maybe occasionally share some specifics about where I work. But I really just want to talk about the industry in general because I don't think any of the effects on the soul are particular to where I work. It's just the 911 industry. Yeah, that's exactly. Before I ask you some soul questions, help us get a general perspective on your normal day at 911. What does an emergency call look like from your point of view? What happens? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, the answer to that question differs by center. So I might use the term center or agency, or if we want to get real fancy, the official term, the insider term, is PSAP, Public Safety Answering Point, PSAP. Uh, you so, are such a PSAP. <laughs> uh, so yeah, from PSAP to PSAP, it is very different on how a 911 call is processed or what goes on with it. But speaking just from our center, when somebody calls 911, we have dedicated call takers that answer the phone. And they enter all of the information into the computer and they send it over to a dedicated dispatcher. And depending on the address and the type of incident that they created, it may go to a certain precinct police dispatcher. There's one dispatcher for each precinct. Or it may go over to our fire and medical side. And those folks work as kind of a team to manage all of the fire and medical incidents in the entire county. And so... That's kind of the life cycle of the call. And then the dispatchers work with the responders to arrive at the location and we assist them in getting extra resources to the scene if they need them or documenting what is taking place or what have you. And then closing out the call when the officers say it's finished and all they need to do is go write a report or when the medical crews have finished transporting or whatever and they go back to their place and, and write reports. So that's the life cycle of a call and that's what it looks like at our location. Is that the is that the question you were answering or asking rather? It, it absolutely is. And for the visual among us now, can you paint a picture of your office or your desk or where you work, the environment that you're working in? 
Yeah. So we're all in one big open room. And we have a whole set of desks reserved for call takers, and we have desks reserved for police dispatchers, and we have desks reserved for fire dispatchers. And then I work as a supervisor, and so we're in our own little collection of desks. But any one of those desks has between seven and eight, sometimes even nine monitors in front of it, a bank of enormous <sighs> monitors. There's usually three keyboards and at least as many mice, sometimes more because some people like the mice that move and some people like the trackball things that are horrible. But anyway, at least as many mice and screens and keyboards and computers, it is a massive amount of information staring one in the face all day long. Okay. And so what kind of person ends up working at 911? <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure that people who work in the industry are wondering very closely how I'm going to answer that question because we're a unique breed. Let's be honest, you want your 911 dispatchers to be smart, knowledgeable, decisive, efficient, able to take control of a chaotic scene and very confident in their decisions, and that those decisions are almost always absolutely spot on. So we have a lot of, I guess some people might call them type A people, people who are smart, confident, knowledgeable, and they're in it, and they're making quick decisions, they're taking control of chaos, and they trust their decisions because they have to. And let me back up. That is a, maybe a, a type of person that we hire. But let's let's back way up. The reality is we hire people who want to help. I mean, you don't show up into this industry without that innate desire to be part of the help system. So everybody starts off with that desire, but they also start off with the kind of skill set or way of approaching the world that I described earlier. That makes sense. So in a given sh shift, how many calls is a call taker generally responding to? Yeah, that varies widely from shift to shift, PSAP to PSAP or center to center. This is a really hard question to answer in, in an industry specific way, because uh, somebody in a really small PSAP might be the only person on duty all night long. They're answering phone calls, they're dispatching police, they're dispatching medical, they're dispatching fire. They're doing all of it because that uh, jurisdiction doesn't have a, a high population and therefore not a lot of call volume. So that one individual might be doing a lot in a given shift, but may only take, say, 10 calls over the course of a night hmm. uh, or a day. But in our center, we have a much higher population. So we have an urban center and a rural center in our county. And so the sum total of calls that we take is pretty astounding. And our folks, they move from position to position throughout the day. So they might take calls for a little while, then they might dispatch a certain precinct for a little while, and then they might do fire and medical for a while. So they kind of rotate every two hours. So somebody who rotates might take 40 to 50 calls in a day. Somebody who isn't certified to do all the other things and might just take calls in a day, they could take 160, 170 calls in a day. And that's a lot. It is a whole lot. And those people are the real heroes. They work hard. And that's a lot. So what's a kind of mid-level example of a kind of call you might get? That's really hard for me to answer because what's mid-level to us is somebody else's emergency, right? And so I don't want to downplay somebody else's emergency by saying, hey, this is only a mid-level call for us. So please don't, as I try to answer this, please don't hear me saying that somebody's grandmother having a heart attack isn't a big deal. 
It's just not. Yeah, we're just, but we're looking at the scale of emergencies you deal with in a given day and trying to get a sense of the range of emergencies. We're not talking about intrinsic value or importance here. Yeah, so with that backdrop in mind, honestly, heart attacks do kind of fall into that mid-level category for us. It's something we take a lot of. We ask some very basic information. We have some scripted answers and some scripted things that we want to say to that caller to be able to provide good patient care. But it's fairly routine for our dispatchers, so it's not overly complicated. It's urgent, but we know how to take those actions. It's not a very dynamic scene. Whereas something that is a lot more impactful is something very dynamic. Everybody there is really worked up, maybe a shooting or a stabbing or something like that. And you get people yelling at you and saying, just get here right now. I don't want to answer all these questions. They don't really comprehend that we're sitting in a chair. We're providing patient care and we're asking questions that are essential for the response while the responders are driving. So they're very worked up. They're yelling. Maybe the scene is changing. Maybe like the bad guy comes back and there's all kinds of chaos in the background and nobody's really talking to us, right? This really gets our adrenaline up because we can't control the scene and there's life safety issues at stake and we can't get any cooperation out of our caller because it's too chaotic. So that's more impactful to us. So that would be an example of kind of a higher level call. And then we actually deal with a lot of low level stuff. We answer the non-emergency line as well. So we might go straight from that chaotic shooting scene to taking a non-emergency complaint about a noisy neighbor who needs to quiet their music down. So the type of calls we deal with are wide and varied. Oh, man. You mentioned that you kind of rotate every two hours. So you're sitting there for a two-hour block, and you could get half a dozen neighbor needs to shut their music down calls. Half a dozen somebody's having a heart attack level calls and what one or two really complicated. This is a major emergency, all hands on deck person on the other end of the line is completely freaking out. Like all of that wrapped up into two hours. Am I catching this right? Yeah. I mean, the proportions might be a little off and there's a variety of calls that we haven't mentioned. You know, we have some folks with mental health problems that call. And so those callers can be a little complicated. We have, you know, things like people calling in drunk drivers or accidents, or we have people calling in fires or various homelessness issues and people camping where they shouldn't camp you know, a whole variety of things, or people got their car stolen, or people got their car broken into. They have complicated custody arrangements, and the other person took the kid when it wasn't their turn to take the kid, and now they want to file a police report. But this is kind of more of a thing that the judge has to sort out and not necessarily the police. So it like we have a lot of variables in what we might encounter in a shift, and it's kind of random. Yeah, so that is a lot of emergency (laughs) in a very small amount of space. I know that that is obvious because it's in the title, but right, like, that's a lot of emergency. It is, and I think people grasp intuitively that there's a lot of emergency. I think what would shock people to know is that, oddly enough, it seems to conflict with everything I just said. There's also a lot of boredom, and that sounds so antithetical to the job. But there are times when, you know, maybe you've taken three or four non-emergency calls in a row, and it's just, hey, my car got broken into. Okay, we ask very few questions about a car getting broken into. The officer deals with all of that on the scene. So it's kind of ho-hum or a noise complaint, and maybe somebody's kind of entitled, and so it's a little irritating. Or 
a variety of different things could just kind of coast along. You know, we don't have any big car accidents. Mm -hmm. We don't have any shooting, stabbings, fires, big deal emergencies happening in the center at the time. Everybody's just kind of cruising along with the normal calls, things that we deal with a thousand times a day. Or maybe <laughs> this is a wonderful thing that we haven't experienced in a while, but maybe there's very few calls coming into the center and you're just kind of waiting for the next thing to happen especially in the middle of the night, that is true. So it's a lot of emergencies that punctuate a lot of boredom. And it's the complete opposite ends that you might go through very, very suddenly that I think is the most shocking to the system. That makes a ton of sense. I mean, at one minute, your adrenaline could have you rushing a million miles an hour. And then 10 minutes later, you're doing the same thing you've done a hundred times and you're just kind of going through the motions mm -hmm. knowing that at any moment you could have to kick it back into gear. Yeah. Yeah. And so, some people get a little twitchy feeling like the next big thing is just, yeah, I'm getting corner. a little twitchy thinking about it. <laughs> and it can get, it can get twitchy, especially at dispatch when you're dispatching police and you know, they're going into a dangerous scene and you wonder, okay, that guy that we know has a gun, are they going to try to pull it out? Are they going to use it in this moment? Is that car going to run away and are they going to flee? And uh, if they need cover, who am I going to send? And, and you start getting this anticipatory paranoia about what could happen because you have to be on your game if it does. So you can get a little twitchy and a little worked up even when uh, the, the thing hasn't happened yet. Yeah, that makes sense. So I want to ask two follow-up questions here. I know that your current role is in a, a level of leadership in this environment. But I yeah. almost want to step back from that for a moment, put you back in the chair where you are just a dispatcher or whatever. With all of what you've just described, doing that day in and day out, or night in and night out, how do you feel like that impacts the soul of a person who is doing this kind of work? There are so many effects on the soul that this could be a very long-winded answer. We talked last time about the soul being the integration center of all the various parts of ourselves. And we have to endure an impact to all of these different parts. We work long hours. Everybody works at least 10 hour days, sometimes 12 or all the way up to 16 hour days. Yeah. I was going to ask, what's the longest shift you've ever worked? I've worked to 16. I think most of us have worked to 16. That's a long day. It is a long day. And sometimes it's not just working the 16. It's a short turnaround for the next shift. So you might work late one day and then come in early the next day. You didn't get a lot of sleep. Now you're back to another 12 hour day. So you have the physical exhaustion, the lack of sleep. We work mm -hmm. goofy hours. What everybody knows is that 911 is always there. What nobody really thinks about is the fact that that means 24 hours a day, seven days a week, regardless of holidays or anything else, snow, sleet, rain, <laughs> like, every weather event where you should stay home, that's not an option for a dispatcher. There's somebody in that seat 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So hmm. it is just a constant grind and it wears on your body, working goofy shifts and different hours and long hours and doing a lot of sitting without getting up too often. So it takes a toll on your body. It takes a toll on your relationships because you're out of sync with the rest of the world when you work these alternate shifts. And so you feel a little out of sync, but then it starts to color your world a little bit. You start to see the negative everywhere because nobody calls you when they're having a good day. You talk to everybody on the worst day of their lives. So it starts to color how you think the world tends to operate. So there's a bad guy in every 7-Eleven waiting to rob the place. Every vehicle that's on the road is just waiting to hit you. Every person walking out of a bar is carrying a loaded firearm. All of these things 
start playing with your brain and you start perceiving the world differently. And so it takes a toll on your mind, but then it also, there's this concept of moral injury where you just feel like you've been a party to something that is just so far outside of who you conceive yourself to be. And maybe you want to do more. Maybe you want to be a bigger part of the solution than you were able to be in that moment. Or just the event itself really rubs you raw. Mm. There is a part of us that just has to get healed after every shift. Let me tell this story. It's not a story from 911. It's actually a sermon that I heard that I thought was the most applicable thing I had ever heard. And I was a dispatcher at the time, so I was in that seat. And the pastor talked about confession and broadened the idea of confession beyond just confessing our sins to God. But we do a lot of confessing that isn't related to admitting a sin. We confess that Jesus is Lord. We confess a variety of things. So it's this unburdening of one's heart. And then he broke down sin into three components, sins that we commit, sins that are committed against us, and then sins that are committed in our presence. And he invited us to confess all three forms of sin. And I thought Mm. that was so insightful that at the end of a long shift, when you have been sinned in front of, sometimes sinned against, you might be surprised that there are people that want to lie to dispatchers and therefore the police. So we get, we get lied to, we get yelled at, we get called all sorts of horrible, nasty names. So we get li- uh, sinned against and sinned in front of for 10, 12, 16 hours. And by the end of it, you just feel that. And you have to confess it. You have to clear your soul. Hmm. So what does that look like? What does it look like to clear your soul in that situation? Yeah. Andy Stanley has really taught me a lot. He wrote a great book called Enemies of the Heart, where he talked about four kind of killer emotions that we have to sort out. And one of the things that he talked about in that book, I can't remember with exactly which emotion, but he said to get really, really specific. And I think it was anger. Get really, really specific about who you're angry with, why you're angry with them, what you think you are owed that you didn't get, and name it. Be very, very, very specific. And by naming it, you really direct your anger where it is due. And then, he says at the very end, then cancel the debt. Once you know exactly why you're angry and what they should have done, what you were owed that you didn't get, then cancel the debt. And that's what true forgiveness is. And that's what dealing with your anger is all about. And I feel like something is similar is true for dispatchers coming off shift. Go back through the day. Name what you experienced. Name how it affected you. Name what you wish would have happened, what you could have done, what the caller could have done, what you know, how the situation could have been different, whatever. Get very, very specific on what is on your heart and what is affecting your soul and allow God to to cancel that, to really meet you in that and repair your soul because, you know, you're just going to go back in for another shift tomorrow and it's going to happen again. Yeah. So thinking about doing that, like trying to put myself in your shoes and I, I may be completely getting this wrong. So I'm I'm offering this as a hypothesis for you then to correct. Okay. But if I were getting out of an, a shift of 10 to 16 hours at a call center and I were going to take some time, let's say on the drive home or whatever, to go back through what has happened, name it, and invite God's healing— My initial emotional response to that is absolutely not. I would not want to rehearse the junk all over again. It was tough enough the first time. (laughs) Is that, am I in the ballpark or am I missing something? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good insight. And I think there are some dispatchers who would absolutely agree with you. And honestly, I kind of fall into a similar camp. I find it exhausting to go back over every detail. But for those incidents that are really sticking with me, that Mm. are really still working on my soul, whether I want them to or not, I think it's vital to take those in particular and be specific with them, process them, process them with a friend, with your spouse, with a family member, with God, but take time to process them. And I'll tell you this, we have a good peer support team at our center. And so a number of folks can be called upon to sit and process through an incident with somebody. And that is so vital because, like I said, we have been colored, our lenses have been colored by the work that we do. And sometimes filtering that out and talking to quote unquote real people is really hard. And some of the assumptions that we bring or some of the baggage that we bring or some of the dark humor or the ways of processing all of this really rubs the general public the wrong way because it feels so callous and it feels so disconnected from what's going on. And in reality, this is just how we process and this is how we cope. And so we don't feel like we have to filter that too much when we're talking with one another. Hmm. But at the same time, I don't think we have to filter that when we're praying either. I think God gets that from the outset. So confess, take what's on your heart, throw it out there because God is in the soul healing business. So whatever's on your soul, just let it out in whatever way you need to let it out. God was going to hear it if you said it to your friend. So, I mean, just say it. Yeah, this is, so the the verses that are I'm being reminded of as you're talking are Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Mm. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For yes. my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Something about the way we often approach prayer is not restful. It is not restorative. It is work. Mm. I wonder, maybe the first question to ask is, in those kind of moments, what would it look like to pray in the wrong way? (laughs) I don't know. And I suspect... There's a thousand wrong ways. I'll tell you one really good right way that worked for me. Our center had dealt with a really crappy call. It was just impactful. It One of those calls that just sucked the life out of the entire room. And I remember walking over to the call taker who had processed that call. The second they disconnected from that call, they threw their headset down. They had tears in their eyes. They were already audibly crying, and they bolted from the operations floor. And everybody already had the wind sucked out of them by listening to this call take place and then watching this reaction. And I worked to console those employees that were involved and get them connected with the peer support team and whatever resources that they needed. But all of it had an impact on my own soul. And I'm even, you can't see it. This is the beauty of radio, but I, I'm, I seriously have tears in my eyes right now. Once everybody was settled and carrying on as best they could, I told my pod partner, the other supervisor on duty with me, I got to go. I got to just, I'm going to go take a break. And I found a quiet conference room and I just laid down. And it was just an invitation to silence and solitude with God. And I don't know if I even prayed words. I just 
knew that God wanted to sit with me. And this was my opportunity to sit with him. I don't know if I even said this. I laid on the conference room floor. I just laid there and I sprawled out kind of in just surrender to God and just letting him meet me in that moment. Mm. And I think something like that, whatever it needs to be for each individual, I think something like that is the right way to pray in those moments. Man, that's good. That's powerful. It's just showing up to God. It's all I could do. I had no words. I had no... I still don't. I just needed to be with God. Well, you know, and you're hitting on a piece of this, but I wonder if there are other thoughts you have about how someone in the 911 community would need to tend their own souls in light of the work that they do. Well, we talked about the soul being the integration center of all the different aspects of us. So as dumb and as simple and as easy as this all sounds, we have to do the basics. Eat right. Get enough sleep if you can. Exercise. Spend time with friends and family. These are soul activities. This is part of who we are as individuals. We have to take care of all of who we are. And so all of those things are important. And then I think also having vital relationships that are not in first response industry, because it is just too easy to reinforce your colored view of the world. And that's not healthy. You need to get around, quote unquote, normal people who don't see trauma around every corner and don't have to interact with it every single day. You need to realize that there's another world out there and you can be a part of it. So mm. all of that, I think, is absolutely vital. If I can take that and just turn the conversation outward a little bit here. First of all, thank you for being willing to share so much of that. There's some really raw, vulnerable, complicated things that you were sharing there. You know, and I remember the in there somewhere you said that one of the concerns people often have is that people outside the industry won't understand. Mm. So thank you for being willing to share. I would be really curious from the folks who are listening what their experience is in their unique life path. What does it look like for them to experience their day-to-day -day life? How does that impact their soul? How do they need to tend their souls as a response to all of that? What does it look like to be healthy-souled people in each of our unique walks of life? And so if you're part of the conversation today, I, I hope that you post about this in response to some of our Facebook posts this week. We would love to hear what you've learned about the soul and caring for it through your daily walk in the world. I would especially love if people have found soul edifying activities or practices that they particularly cherish. I'd love to collect a list. I'm actually feeling really, really exhausted right now. That conversation took way more out of me than I ever thought. I, I didn't even expect that. So if you all want to bring me back up by sharing what helps heal your soul, boy, I'll take it. Mm, yeah, that would be great. So I have been sharing a lot of thoughts, and I would love just a couple of moments here to recollect myself. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to you, Josh from Missouri, and I'd love to hear what you've been thinking about this week. Man, well, lots of things, but uh, one thing, just on the, the simplest level, I have been thinking about a lot about mentoring. Our church that I work at now focuses a lot on mentoring. Most of the folks that come to our church are coming as returning citizens or former addicts. They may be living in one of the recovery houses or a discipleship home or something like that. 
And I've just been thinking a lot as I talk with people about the power of the simple question, what is your next step? Hmm. What's your next step? So often I think that whatever the topic is that we're talking about, particularly in mentoring, discipleship, or even just faith in general, it's very easy to stay in the vague generality realm and to feel like you've had a really powerful mentoring conversation where somebody has talked about the fact that they need to read their Bible or they need to pray more or they need to fast or they need to, whatever the spiritual habit is, work on silence or solitude or whatever. But what's your next step brings that vague generality into concrete practice in a way that I think is incredibly powerful. Yeah. I was watching myself this last week. I bet about half my conversations throughout the week in my personal life, in my vocational life, with my kids, with parishioners, with leaders, with new believers. I bet about half, maybe three quarters of my conversations went towards this one question of, okay, so what are your next steps in some <laughs> way, shape, or form? It's just a powerful, powerful question for making concrete progress in key areas of our lives. And so I asked myself this this week because I recently went to my regular annual physical and I had some blood work done and my cholesterol is high, not excessively high, but high enough that I can either start taking small steps now or I will have to take significant steps later. And so thinking to myself, you know, I want to cut down on my cholesterol intake is fine. But asking myself, what are my next steps is a whole different level of practical. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally does. I love that question. What is your next step? You have been asking that as a pastor for a long time, and many of the stories you've told me about your pastoral conversations have included that question, and I have used it myself. And it's it's a great question, and it does really simplify matters greatly. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think it's so simple and yet so practical. Mm. And what about you? What What have you been thinking about? Other than work and 911 and the soul and all of that. Yeah. Which, by the way, you talked about pastoring, and I'm very excited for next week's conversation to talk about the effects of pastoring on the pastor's soul. So we get to flip the script next week, and boy, prepare yourself. If it's as exhausting as it was for me, uh, good luck. But yeah, so this week, I've actually been preparing for my upcoming semester, which as we record today starts in about a week and a half. And I'm very excited for it, but I wanted to read to you the list of books that will be required reading for one of my classes that is particularly germane to this podcast. So I'm going to take a class on processes and practices of spiritual formation. Ooh, yes. It's going to be so good. So one reference book we'll be using, and I've used this a number of times in various classes and things throughout my seminary time, the Spiritual Disciplines Handbook by Adele Calhoun. Really great reference work that gives a page and a half to two pages on all sorts of spiritual practices, what it is, how to do it, why you might want to consider it in your own life, and how to go about it. Really, really practical, great reference guide. So I'll be using that, but here are the other assigned reading. Breaking Old Rhythms, Answering the Call of a Creative God by Amina Brown. Mm. Toward God, The Ancient Wisdom of Western Prayer by Michael Casey. Eat This Book, A Conversation in the Art of Spiritual Reading by Eugene Peterson. The Purpose of Man, Designated to Worship, or Designed to Worship by A.W. Tozer. And the one we highlighted last week, Dallas Willard's Renovation of the Heart. 
putting on the character oh. of Christ, which will be, I think, the third or fourth time I've read that book. So I'm actually looking forward to reading it again. So Willard, Tozer, and Peterson are just rock stars. I don't know anything about Michael Casey or Amina Brown. Maybe you do. But the titles of their books sound amazing. Yeah, no, I am i don't know anything about Michael Casey. I'm looking at his book now on Amazon. It looks absolutely intriguing, and I'm, I'm super excited to get updates on all of this. Yes. This is going to fuel so many thoughts that are going to make their way onto this podcast. I at least had to give you a reason why you were hearing so much from this class. Yes, I can't wait. I'm super excited. Yes. Well, I think we posted this last week a which Josh question, which Josh laughs in his sleep. <laughs> which is such a great way to end such a heavy episode. So this is yes. this is awesome. Yes. And I feel like I need to do some sort of he who laughed first. <laughs> Your answer to it was laughter, and I think that's the answer. Right, uh, right. You're you're going off of the childhood saying, "Whoever smelt it, dealt it," and you're trying to. I like... absolutely <laughs> am. Yes, that is exactly where I went with that. Yes, um, yeah. Well, in I can't all help the you. Depth of my maturity as a a graduate degree holding pastor. Um, <laughs> I went with an attempt to paraphrase, he who smelt it, dealt it. <laughs> hey, at least we made it this far into the podcast before showing our true colors. So, <laughs> uh, yes, I am the Josh that laughs in his sleep and my wife ridicules me for this often. I have woken her up many times. I've actually woken myself up laughing in my <laughs> sleep. That's my favorite part. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's it's fantastic. So I don't know. I don't I never remember what makes me laugh, but man, are my dreams hilarious. So if I ever remember them, I'll be sure to share them with you. I'm sure you'll love them. But oh my gosh, I laugh in my sleep at least probably once a month. And yeah, it's something about me. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love it. Well, hey, are we on for next week? We absolutely are. I'm looking forward to it. All right. I'll talk to you then. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.